Well, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us, and I'm pleased that we have so many people from throughout Winter Park and the region who could be with us today. I know that this crisis is falling on many of us by degrees, and it certainly was the case for me when we started looking at the impact of businesses last week. And our mission at the Winter Park Chamber of Commerce is to convene people and ideas for the benefit of our businesses and our community. And it's a privilege to be able to continue that mission. We weren't sure how we were gonna do that beginning two weeks ago. And um, I'm grateful to my team, especially led by our Associate Vice President, Amy Morgan, who's our call mm -hmm. moderator. I'm incredibly grateful to Representative Anas Kamani, whose office has been instrumental uh, not only in managing this crisis, but in setting up this call today. And I'm deeply grateful to Ken Lawson, the director of the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, Mike DiNapoli, the director of the Office of Small and Minority Business Capital from DEO, uh, Michael Meyer, who is the CEO of Florida SBDC Network, and Carolyn Scobe with um, One Florida Bank, who's our sponsor here today. I know that when we started thinking about how do we help businesses access the help they need as quickly as they need it, uh, people started sharing with us that, that small business loans are notoriously cumbersome and difficult to access. And it became clear that people didn't understand the state of Florida's disaster emergency bridge loan program. And we wanted to help differentiate between the federal SBA and what's available through the state of Florida and how fortunate we are to have experienced people who've navigated the disaster bridge loan program by virtue of the experience we have with hurricanes. And I feel very fortunate that we have the wealth of expertise on this call. We wanted to bring it right to our members and our community and let you know what's available to you to help out with, uh, with bridging between the now and the not yet in this crisis. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over uh, to our speakers, probably I'll ask Representative Eskamani to do a quick greeting because we are grateful to you and your team. I know you're not sleeping very much right now, Representative, and we thank you for um, your constant advocacy for Winter Park in our region at the legislative level. Thank you so much, Betsy, and, and thank you everyone to the Winter Park Chamber for putting this together and to our um, keynote speakers coming from different state agencies. I'll be very brief because I, I do know that um, the speakers uh, following me are going to have some really great information specific to um, application processes and so forth. Um, but again, my name is Anna Eskamani. I'm really proud to be serving Winter Park um, alongside Save Orlando and Bell Island Edgewood in the Florida legislature as your representative for District 47. Um, our office has been nonstop responding uh, to the COVID-19 crisis, especially being there for our small businesses and for those who have now faced unemployment, some for the first time ever. Um, I want to be clear that there's a lot of fluid moving pieces here. So I'm um, really grateful for uh, this webinar because I think it'll provide some predictability and what really is an unprecedented situation. And we all know that for our small businesses, the predictability is, is ideal. It helps us plan for the future. And I think right now what is making folks so nervous is that it's really hard to plan right now. So hopefully this will provide um, some solid grounding for the future of your small business. Um, I do want to let folks know that uh, we've been very much focused on public health services and trying to deliver information as much as possible. We've developed um, a one-stop shop guide called uh, CFLCOVID.com. It's our coronavirus guide for Central Florida. And we actually do outline there recent actions taken by the executive branch, by Congress, um, information for our schools and universities alongside reemployment assistance and small business information. And we actually just added a few links to different private funds providing support for small businesses, including Facebook doing some um, grant work and so forth. So I encourage you to definitely check out that link. We'll make sure um, it gets emailed to folks after the call, but uh, we do our best to update that daily. So it's a great source of information regarding some of the issues we'll talk about today, but also some of those untraditional sources of revenue and support coming from different parts of um, the nation. Um, to that point, some other issues that we've been working on um, is not only small business relief, but also um, trying to see what relief there is for nonprofits. We know, especially in Winter Park, we have incredible nonprofit organizations, organizations in the arts and culture world that feed into our economy. And unfortunately, the bridge loan program at this point is 
not available to nonprofits. So we're trying to see what are other resources out there for the nonprofit community. Um, we've also been trying to reduce your monthly burden. Um, knowing that all of our small businesses are paying different licensing fees depending on what service you provide. Um, and so we're trying to talk to uh, Department of Revenue, uh, to DBBR about reducing those fees, whether it's for the time you're not in operation or for, in the case of uh, Department of Revenue, trying to get flexibility on when you, when you pay sales tax and other types of taxes so that you can have some um, cash on hand versus giving it to the government right now. Um, and then also, uh, we've been really trying to dive deep into business interruption insurance. We've heard from, at this point, more than 15 small businesses that their business interruption insurance is not providing coverage right now um, for this pandemic. And so I'm setting up a call with the Office of Insurance Regulation tomorrow to see what can be done about that. So if you are having that issue, just know we're exploring it and we'll definitely keep folks, folks posted on the outcome. Um, and then finally, um, you're doing our best as well to support um, all the workers who are now unemployed, whether they're your workers or workers in different companies, just know that in addition to our advocacy for small businesses, we're also concerned about the unemployment rate as a whole and the reemployment assistance benefits in Florida. Because unfortunately, if you are self-employed, um, you don't you're likely not going to qualify under the current structure in Florida. Um, which is why there's been a lot of emphasis on the federal government relief package, and I know today um, that continues to be debated. And uh, the most recent package that I saw does include um, grants that go to non uh, that go to small businesses, support for nonprofits with payroll and things like that for both nonprofits and small businesses. And we've also seen conversation about actually putting cash directly in the hands of the American people um, to help offset other costs in their life. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation, here to help answer questions. And again, thank you to everyone and to um, Bessie's leadership to the chamber for bringing us all together today. Thank you, Amy. I think we'll send it back to you. And uh, we've got our agenda that we're going to run. Um, I, I know we're all getting used to Zoom calls and uh, webinars is our uh, new way of life. So I'll kick mm -hmm. it back to you. Thank you, Representative Eskamani, again, who's instrumental in getting this set up yeah, for us yeah. today. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, as we mentioned, we have a couple of panelists here that are ready to share information with you and answer questions. Um, first, we would like to have Ken Lawson share his message. Ken, can I pass it to you? Hey, thank you so much. Hey, I'm the head of DEO, and folks need to know this at my department. You know, with my 1,500 people, we're really working hard to help our small businesses and individuals who are suffering through this crisis. You know, a couple of things I want you to know before I introduce Mike DiNapoli, who's my director of the Office of Small Business. You know, we're collecting information from all businesses so we can apply for federal funds as they come available. I ask for folks to go to this website, floridadisaster.biz, B-I-Z, and fill out the Business Disaster Survey. They'll ask you questions about the impact of COVID-19 on your business. And again, as with this information, we're collecting it. And then as we have different funds available from the federal government, we have those stats available. So far, I have you know, over 6,000 surveys filled out from businesses across the state. Then second, regarding uh, reemployment assistance, if you go to the website, floridajobs.org, and look at the icon for reemployment assistance, you'll see information about how to apply for reemployment benefits. Also, there's a section for employers. There's two programs I'd like for you to look at. One's called Temporary Layoff, and we lay off individuals for eight weeks, more than eight weeks, and they're not receiving pay, they're eligible for unemployment benefits. And also, there's a program called Short-Time Compensation. If you cut the, your employees' uh, work hours by a certain percentage, you can cover the gap. So go to that website, please. With that being said, I'd like to introduce Mike Napoli. He'll talk to you about the small business bridge loan that's available for our small business partners. Mike? Thank you, Ken. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation here. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much to the chamber to have us present here. Are you both in the same room by chance? I yes. Yeah. Okay, let's um, hang up hang up one of them, please, because otherwise it'll create an echo. Got it. Thank you. So I'm going to just share my screen. Just give me a moment to do that. Zoom.
How's that? Can we see the screen? Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, looks good. Can't hear me. We oh, can sorry. hear you. We can hear you and we can see the screen. Can you see it now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm sorry. Let's see. Some trouble here with the. Can they hear you? They can hear me. I believe they can hear me. Just trying to get it up. We had it there. There we go. How's that? Great. Great. Technical difficulties. I apologize. Again, as Director Lawson said, my name is Mike DiNapoli, and I run the Office of Small Business here. And we've been running the Bridge Loan for quite some time now with our partners at the SBDC and um, uh, within DEO. We've done this quite a few times over the last couple of years from Irma and Michael and now this, uh, COVID-19. So what I want to do is just share some slides on how to actually begin an application for a business to uh, go into our online site and directly apply on that site. So as Dr. Lawson said, floridadisaster.biz is one of the sites that we're directing people to. And the other one is rebuildflorida.gov, both of which will take you to this site here to apply. I don't want to get into too many particulars. They're all right here. All of the information is on that site. Uh, you can visit that and read all the eligibility questions. You can read the terms uh, and, and you can certainly call the SBDC or you can call us. We're happy to answer some questions, but I encourage you to begin the application. So this was opened up on March 9th. Uh, the bridge loan was activated for small businesses from two employees to 100 to apply for the Small Business Emergency Bridge Loan. It's open until May 8th for you to go online and complete the application. So I'm just gonna go here real quick through some of these slides. Once you get to that site, you'll see this icon. It says click here to sign in or create a new account by clicking both, by clicking that you can access both of them. So you can log back in once you already set up an application, you can log back in and see the status of your account. But I encourage everybody to sign in, username, password. Uh, you'll get a, a, an identifiable um, code that allows you to log back in. So there's about 20 slides here and I don't wanna stay on one too long. It is pretty intuitive. So again, this is the click here to begin your application. You can see there, there's also an icon right above it that says my loan application, which will allow you to go back in once you've started the application. Remember though, that once you sign it, once you submit your application, you cannot go in and change your application. You can go in and see the status of the application, but you can't go in and alter the application. So I encourage you, upload all your documents and I'll show you where you can do that and submit it so it gets into the system. So eligibility questions, you'll see that on the front few pages. Uh, just keep going by answering the questions. This is where we've seen some errors and people are not answering this question. Are you applying for the emergency bridge loan? This is a drop down where you can click and say, you should say yes, I'm applying for the emergency bridge loan. Fill out all the information, keep going. On here, you'll see the sections one through seven. This application was started for, for one of our other programs. We took out the important aspects of it to get this bridge loan application online. We've received thousands of applications both on this system in the last week, actually Wednesday will be a week, and I believe there's something like 6,000 applications that have been submitted. That's on top of the paper applications and email applications, which we do not want to receive anymore. We want to have them online. It makes it so much easier. So section one and two are required here. Section three, four, and five, once you complete those sections, one and two, three, four, and five automatically check off because it's not required. However, we are asking folks to go in and complete section four. You can go into section three, four, and five, and we, wa we want you to, but it's not required at this time to submit an application. 
I can get into techni the, the technology behind it, but it's really not, it's not important at this time. We want to make sure that we get these applications in and we want to make sure that we get as much information as possible. On section four is where you would put the dollar amount that you require. So I encourage everybody to, to put that in there because if you don't, that requires somebody else to get back in touch with you and complete that application with you. So I'm gonna keep going here. You're gonna be given a PID. Um, the app, that is your personal identification number. Um, once you started it, as you can see some of the notes there, uh, you can log back in and see what the status is. Some of the repeated slides here. Um, important to put your name, everything you possibly can here. This is all section one applicant information. It's pretty self-intuitive. Two is this, the business information. Again, very intuitive. It's important that you put the owner's name here. You can see down here the owner's name and the percentage of the ownership. The bridge loan requires that you have the business owners who have at least 51% of the business. So if you've got one owner with 51%, they can apply just under their name. If you need two owners, you need to then click over here where it says, are there more than one owner? And then put the number amount of owners, the number of owners, one, two, three, and then click save. And it'll then open up the, the fields for more owners. So remember it's 51% that must be input to have the application be complete. Section three is lender information. Now we, we've taken this from one of our other applications where, we're, where we were requiring other lenders to participate in our loans, not so in here. So the only thing that you need to do is you can click up there saying I'm completing this information, this application independently. That way any of the red dots that are required are now not required. I encourage you to get some help from the SBDC. Uh, you can put their information there. Um, but I encourage you to, to get as much help as you can with this if, if you do require it. Here's important on section four that I mentioned. Section four is where we would ask for project summary. Again, we took this from another application, so it's not exactly identical as we'd like it to be or, or descriptive as we'd like it to be, but this is where you need to input the dollar amount that you're looking for. And remember, this is up to $50,000, so you put $50,000 right there. If you have the reasoning for all the dollars that you need, in other words, to purchase equipment, to pay employees, you can put it there, but it's not important at this time. We just want you to put at least the dollar amount in working capital. It'll then total it up on the side over here and it'll give us a, a, a dollar amount requested um, from all the borrowers. Section seven is where we need all your uploaded information. This is where all the attachments would go, tax returns, IRS forms, payroll documents, miscellaneous documents. That's where you would want to upload all your documents. This is what we need for a complete application. Once you submit it, again, you're not going to be able to go back in and upload documents. You're then going to need to work with an SBDC consultant to get the documents uploaded. They're going to need to go in and put hands on it to get it complete. Please try and get all the documents that you need. There is a list on our front website that tells you what we need. Look at that list, go through the list, and try and get all your documents before you start the application. Credit reports are pulled. Um, remember that as well. We're also running into the, the problem where credits are frozen. I know in a lot of these difficult times, people go in and freeze their credits at the credit bureaus. That needs to be unfrozen so we can pull credit. <clears throat> so here's some of the documents that are listed that we require. Uh, it's pretty standard across the board, depending on what type of business you are may determine the documents. For example, if you are uh, an LLC or a C Corp or an S Corp, some of the documents might be a little bit different. Some of the tax documents might be a little bit different. We're still gonna need those documents. Uh, don't think that we don't. We do need those documents. Tax returns, both personal and business are gonna be required. Once that's complete, you'll see the check marks here on the entire one through seven section are complete, you can then submit the application. Once you submit the application, you can't alter the application. Just wanna make sure that everybody's aware of that. There's our contact information, the phone number and the email that you can send uh, questions and inquiries to. Uh, we do not wanna receive applications via email. It just slows the process down. As you can imagine, we have thousands of emails that we need to go through that do have applications that um, we encourage, we try to encourage everybody to go online. 
Um, I understand, uh, I heard the question, I just want to uh, sort of answer a question up front where people were, were concerned about nonprofits in, in Central Florida, nonprofits not being able to apply for the bridge loan. Uh, this bridge loan is not set up for nonprofits. That's um, unfortunate, but the way it is set up and the way we lend, these are personal loans to business owners. Nonprofits aren't set up like that. Our nonprofits are not owned by business owners. So it's not that we don't want to support them. It's just this bridge loan is not is not able to do that to nonprofits. And, and I know Mike Meyer is going to follow up and I'm glad Mike goes behind because then I know he can clean up and answer questions that I, that I missed. So or answer topics that I missed. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mike or turn it back to, um, to Tiffany. Thank you, Mike. I want to uh, hand it over to Mike Meyer. We do, we are getting a lot of questions coming in. Please rest assured, we're going to open it up for all of our panelists for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Mike Meyer here coming right up. And um, remember to unmute your mute button, Mike, before you start speaking. And thank you very much to Mike DiNapoli. We appreciate it. And to Secretary Lawson. Mike, we need you to unmute. I'm unmuted yep. and uh, now sharing my screen as well. Great. Is that good? Yep. Good. Thank you. All right. I, I, I can navigate Zoom. Uh, first, I got to give kudos to uh, Representative uh, es uh, Eskimani. Uh, she is a true champion in the Florida legislature for small businesses in Winter Park. And I just got to acknowledge her for that. Um, as Betsy said, I'm, I'm Mike Meyer. I'm the CEO for the Florida Small Business Development Center Network, and we're the state's um, principal small business development agency. Uh, we recognize that COVID-19 or the coronavirus and the policies being enacted by our policymakers to really protect the citizens of Florida um, are creating a very significant impact for our state's small businesses. Um, on the state's emergency response team, the Florida SBDC network is designated as the first responders for small businesses when a major disaster event takes place, which means that we really lead in the coordination and facilitation of both the federal and the state resources that are available to small businesses, uh, especially uh, in the administration of the Florida Small Business Emergency Bridge Loan Program, which Mike Dinopoli just provided some details on. I'm going to take a little bit of a deeper dive in how the program works, eligibility, et cetera, and then how to seek assistance from the SBDC. Uh, but the Florida SBDC network works in partnership with the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity. And the uh, emergency bridge loan is really a short-term interest-free working capital loan. So small businesses really have a lot of flexibility about how they use this emergency capital. But that's exactly what it is. It's short-term emergency capital to help bridge the gap between the disaster event and uh, the access to long-term assistance. Uh, I really think that this program is genius and a lot of states have actually reached out to Florida about, about the program because uh, I think it was back when Jeb Bush was governor and the Florida legislature at the time recognized that it took a long time for federal assistance to really be put in place. And every day that passes by that small businesses don't reopen after a major disaster event, the likelihood of them ever reopening goes down substantially. Uh, so this is a great uh, great tool in the toolbox of Florida and for Florida small businesses. Now it's important to emphasize that this is not a grant, that this is a loan, a loan that's backed by taxpayer, by the taxpayers of Florida. So it's important that uh, our small businesses understand that there is not forgiveness to this particular loan, but rather an obligation back to the taxpayers in order to access this uh, interest-free capital. Now the maximum loan amount, as Mike said, is $50,000. However, I will uh, 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 identify the fact that any business that seeks capital that's $25,000 or less from this particular loan program, it meets certain credit score criteria. That is, if any of the owner applicants have a credit score of 680 or higher, it'll actually enter into our fast track process. So rather than the loan application and package going to a, an independent loan review committee, it'll actually just immediately qualify and uh, closing documents will be produced and promissory notes will be executed and we'll be able to uh, uh, immediately close on that loan. Uh, so the process is shortened pretty substantially, I would say by at least a couple to four or five days. Uh, the term of the loan is one year, 365 days from the date of the promissory note. So not the declaration of the event itself, but the execution of the loan agreement. 
Uh, and as I said, it is a interest-free loan for the term of the loan. Now, the applicant for the emergency bridge loan is actually the majority ownership of the small business itself. So it's important to understand that if you're a partnership or LLC with multiple members or an S Corp or C Corp with multiple stockholders, that you need at least 51 of the uh, ownership of the business to complete the application and provide the required documentation, which I'll uh, talk about here in a couple of seconds. Uh, there is a limitation that you can only receive one bridge loan. I often get the question, well, I have several locations for my business. Regrettably, you can only receive one bridge loan per business. However, if you're one of those serial entrepreneurs and you have multiple businesses, um, proven by the evidence of uh, filing uh, federal business tax returns for each entity, then you can receive a bridge loan for each one of your uh, individual businesses. Now, these are unsecured loans, so therefore there is no collateral requirement, which actually helps expedite the process pretty substantially. Um, the proceeds must be used to maintain the operations of the business or restarting the business uh, in Florida. Uh, and during the closing process, if you're approved and we're uh, executing the closing documents, you will certify that if you uh, receive federal long-term assistance, such as an SBA economic injury disaster loan, uh, or you receive insurance proceeds, uh, if you're fortunate enough to do so, uh, that you'll use those proceeds to pay back the bridge loan. Now, the application deadline is currently set for May 8th. Um, however, I strongly discourage any small business being impacted by COVID-19 to wait to apply for this particular loan. Uh, the proceeds uh, or appropriations for it are limited, um, uh, and I would encourage anybody to get into the process as quickly as possible for the best chance of uh, accessing this uh, emergency capital. Now, as I said, uh, the loan has to be repaid in full by the maturity date uh, established in the loan agreement. Uh, there are consequences if you go into default. Uh, first, uh, you, uh, the, the interest rate will go on, on day 366 from 0% to 12%. And many people would think, well, that's, that's okay, I can handle that particular interest. But the loan is technically in default. Uh, so it's really a penalty interest uh, in which the small business has to pay. Furthermore, the state has an obligation to actually send to, within a specified period of time, it's a statutory requirement, the loan or default from, um, to the state to a collection agency. Uh, and that collection agency will add a premium of 13 to 15% on top of the principal and interest owed at that particular time. Uh, so all of a sudden this loan went from a zero interest loan to a 12% loan with an additional premium of 15, up to 15% added on top of it. Uh, furthermore, the collection agency, if they're unable to collect the debt uh, in a timely way, will report the default to uh, the credit reporting agencies. So neither the state of Florida, the governor, the Department of Economic Opportunity, or the Florida SBDC want this to occur. So we will be uh, making sure that we monitor those that uh, do receive a bridge loan. Um, and as they approach the maturity date, we will be reaching out to them to see whether or not they're going to have any issues in making that payment by the end of the term. Uh, and what solutions we can create for them by either accessing other capital um, um, or, or finding a plan to, uh, to repay the loan. Um, talk a little bit about the four-step process with respect to the application. Uh, Mr. Dinopoli, my friend there over at DEO, uh, went through sort of kind of the online application in itself. But there are really four steps to determining whether or not you should even start the application. The first step is to determine whether or not you're even eligible. To be eligible for the bridge loan, you must have had been established and actively operating your business prior to the disaster event. And of course, the business has to be physically located in the state of Florida. What we mean by actively operating is that you actually have to be or um, should have been in business producing or selling the service or product um, that your business sells. Uh, so that's what we mean by uh, uh, actively operating. Um, as Mike said, uh, you must be a for-profit, privately held small business that has a minimum of two employees, but no more than 100. But the definition of employees for this particular program means not just W-2 employees, but it's also inclusive of what we commonly refer to as 1099 employees or independent contractors and uh, leased employees if you're one of those companies that use a PEO to access uh, your workforce. 
So those all count towards that minimum two employee uh, in order to be eligible for this particular program. Furthermore, if you've had a previous bridge loan, but you haven't repaid that bridge loan in full, you're unable to or you're ineligible to apply for another bridge loan. And then finally, uh, you need to demonstrate that you suffered significant economic uh, distress uh, or injury because of COVID-19, which I think is uh, pretty easy to do uh, for, for our small businesses in the state. Uh, step two is to gather those uh, required documents that Mike talked about. Um, there are um, several different documents. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you need to pull together the previous two years of the business tax returns. Now, you might uh, be one of those businesses that started in 2019 or even in 2000, uh, uh, 2020, um, and you might not have your business tax returns because you haven't filed yet. That doesn't make you ineligible. You just simply need to explain why you don't have your business tax statements uh, that you started the business within the last year, for example. Uh, but you do need to show or demonstrate that uh, you do have those minimum number of two employees uh, and therefore need to provide employer tax statements. These are generally uh, these forms that are listed on the presentation, IRS Forms 941, W3, or W2s, um, if you have um, what we call the standard employee, or the 1099 miscellaneous forms uh, for the compensation that shows on that form, the compensation paid to independent contractors, or if you do use a PEO for leased employees, you need to get a statement that provides the individual employee information from your PEO. And then finally, um, you need uh, for each applicant listed on the application, remember you need to have 51% of the business ownership on the application. So if you have multiple individuals or partners on the application, each applicant listed on the application needs to provide their previous two years income tax statements. Now you'll have many people that uh, uh, did not yet file their 2019 uh, personal tax returns and the IRS has extended that deadline out to July. That's perfectly okay. You just simply need to bring your 2017 or 2018 personal tax statements. Um, and when, then what you wanna do with those is you want to scan them or save them as PDFs because you're gonna need to upload them to the online application. So then step three is starting and uh, completing that online application. And as Mike said, you can find that application at floridajobs.org. DEO has done a great job of really just making their website about what's going on with respect to emergency. So when you go to floridajobs.org, you'll see on the left side information about reemployment assistance. And on the right side, you'll see information about the emergency bridge loan. Just simply start that application process and walk through it. Now I put in here, use Chrome. Uh, the online application is really has been built on a platform that is uh, Chrome is the best browser to use when uh, completing that that online application. So it's a it's a way to avoid a lot of technical issues. And then finally, step four is wait patiently. Uh, I already seen some of the questions, and I was proactive in responding to some of those. There's been unprecedented demand with respect to this particular program. As Mike said, we've actually received several thousand applications by email, by fax, by courier, by mail, and by online. Um, and so we're just asking people, please be understanding in the fact that we have a lot of applications to get through. We're doing our best to provide that individual customized service that I expect of our SBDC professionals. So please just give us some latitude. Um, my hope and the expectation that we're setting for ourselves is that uh, upon the submission of a completed application, that we should be responsive within two weeks to, um, to our small businesses. Um, so again, please be patient with us. Um, if you have questions about uh, the Emergency Bridge Loan Program or the, uh, you have technical issues with the online application, you can reach out to DEO's call center at 833-833. 832-4494, uh, which I think is the best way to get those questions answered. Uh, you can certainly reach out to them via email as well, and that email is listed uh, on the slide. Um, but if you're one of those businesses that uh, find that sometimes these applications, either the state application or the federal application, are complicated and bureaucratic, please, I would highly encourage you to reach out to your local SBDC. We have disaster loan specialists that can specifically help you walk through that particular application 
and what's required and, and, and really provide that individual service. So with that, Amy, I, uh, I will just simply say, you know, about myself, um, you will not find a stronger advocate for our small businesses in Florida. They are so instrumental to the uh, economic well-being of our, um, our economy in Florida. And we know that economy had been really growing strong over uh, the past few years. We want to continue that trend. And so therefore, we know that we need to get our, our small businesses back in business as quickly as possible. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you, Betsy or, or Amy. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. And we really appreciate that you're working long days on behalf of Florida's small businesses right now. We wanted to localize our presentation a little bit today. and We thank One Florida Bank for their partnership in putting on this webinar. Uh, my dear friend, Carolyn Skog, is the SVP of SBA Lending at One Florida Bank. And if, Carolyn, you could unmute and share with us a little bit about how we can access some personalized attention at One Florida Bank right now. Uh, for us locally in this market, I'd be grateful. Sure. sure, thank you for having me. I appreciate you putting this on for our small business, Betsy. I mean, this is just such a such important information to get out to everybody. We're all in this together. Um, you know, there's nobody that has not been impacted by this, so, so we are here to support our small business. Um, are you able to see my screen or do I need to enact that share screen as well? Let's do the share screen again. Okay. There you go. So, and, um, you know, Mike, Mike can probably um, talk to, talk to the, the small business disaster loan program as well. One thing, one distinction that, that I would like to make is that I'm an SBA lender. Um, one Florida bank provides SBA loans for, for small businesses throughout the state of Florida, but the SBA disaster loan is a loan that's directly off offered by SBA. Um, so while I can help you navigate through the applications and, and do my best to answer questions, it's, it's not a loan that's offered by One Florida Bank, it's directly through SBA. Um, let's see, forgive me, I'm not very technical. So I've put the, the um, website for applying for the loan as well as the customer service center number for SBA for the disaster relief program. Um, feel free to reach out to them directly. The application is available online. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple process for submitting the application, but it, it does go directly through SBA. The, the forms that are needed, um, I've pr provided the link in this presentation, which I understand is gonna be um, made available to all the participants in the call today. So if you click on the link, it will take you directly to those applications. Um, there's a couple different things that I would like to, to point out um, with regard to, to the loan itself and, and to the application. So one thing that, that's different about the, the economic disaster relief loan is my understanding, and Mike, please correct me if I'm wrong, this is available to nonprofits. Um, it's a, including houses of worship. So there, if you have um, some of the nonprofits in Winter Park that have been affected, and we are starting to hear from some of our local churches that um, they obviously are seeing the impact no different than anyone else, this program is available for them as well. Um, so there are two different forms that I would like to make you aware of. So. One is the application SBA Form 5. So if you are a company that is an LLC, an S Corp, um, a partner, limited partnership, anything that you file a, a, a federal tax return other than on your personal, even if it's Schedule C that you're filing under your personal, if it's an LLC or anything like that, use SBA Form 5. There is another form, it's SBA Form 5C that is for a sole proprietorship. So if you have, um, if you're an independent operator and you file as, as a sole proprietor, but not an LLC, you would use this, this separate form 5C. It will say it's a little bit deceptive because it says it's a home loan, but just understand it's, all, it's for a sole proprietorship. Um, going back to the nonprofits, they would use the SBA form five and I've, been, I've, well, I've, I'm sorry, I've sent the forms as well to April 
um, and so to Tiffany if you have questions. One of the things on the form that people are getting tripped up on on the corporate application form is there's a couple different options for the type of loan that you're applying for. Um, most of the thing, most of the loans that are being declined are for technical difficulties. So make sure you're checking the economic injury box. So we have not had any real property damage from, from this disaster. Um, there haven't been any content, so it is the economic injury box that needs to be checked. And that's not on the sole prop form, that's just on the, on the business application form. Um, one other thing that's, that's a little bit unique about this particular loan program is that we do require tax certifications. So the 4506P is a form that needs to be completed by, um, by any owner of the business that owns 20% or more of the applicant business, or if there's an affiliation through common ownership. So say for instance, you have someone of a business, an owner that has 10%, but they have the same ownership in another company that in which they own 50%, we would need to get this form for, for everyone. So that's a little bit of a technical difficulty. If you have any questions, again, please feel free to reach out to me and I can help navigate through that. Um, then the other two forms are pretty straightforward, a personal financial statement form, um, and then a, a statement of, of the SBA will want to know all the business debt that the business has. So, so that's the other form that is, is included in that. Um, this is a secured loan if collateral is available. Um, the loan terms are available up to 30 years, and that's determined by SBA, similar to the bridge loan um, that, that Mike told you about. It is interest-free and payment-free for the first 12 months, but then it converts to a term loan that's up to 30 years, and SBA will make that determination based on the business's ability to repay. Um, you won't be turned down if you don't have sufficient collateral to secure the loan, but the loan, if there is available collateral through personal assets, anything like that, SBA will require that those assets are used to secure the loan. If you have a loan, whether it's an SBA loan, an existing loan, or a regular conventional loan, please, I urge you to stay in contact with your bankers. As I said, and as everybody said, this is a, a nationwide problem. There's no corner of our country that's not untouched by this. No, no industry, no sector, no one who is not touched. So please stay in communication with your banker. If they don't know you have a problem, they can't help you. And you don't wanna wait until um, the loan is past due or you're having difficulties to reach out. So be proactive. Stay in touch. I've talked to a number of, of our borrowers who are really working hard to keep their employees. Um, you know, it's, it's a very difficult situation for everybody on both sides. So please, please stay in touch with your banker. Um, an inside hint, just as I, as I mentioned before, if people are getting hung up on, you know, simply checking a box or failing to check a box on the uh, economic industry or injury rather. So that is, that is key. Make sure you are double checking your forms, making sure the information is provided accurately and all of the information is filled out. If you have any questions, again, reach out to me and I'm happy to help just as the SBDC is or, or the SBA helpline as well. Again, these are the websites and the numbers that you can reach out for assistance. Um, my contact information is here. I'm working remotely as everybody else is, but I'm available on my cell phone. Um, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Great. Carolyn, let's leave that up just for a minute. People could take a picture of the screen with your contact details on it. I know some people will choose to access cr private credit facility right now, and that's something, Carolyn, you could help with as well in this instance, correct? That's correct. Okay, That's great. Correct. I want to thank you for your yeah. partnership with that. Um, at this point, we do have some questions. I think some of them have been answered already, but I'm going to say a couple things and then hand it over to Amy. I wanted to let you know that there were 78 of you on this call, um, and I want to assure Secretary Lawson and 
um, the DEO that we have already encouraged our members to do the business interruption um, survey or the business survey of assessment of damage. Um, at the business impact survey, that's what it is, sorry. And we will continue to ask our members to do that to assist in reporting um, the extent of the devastation here in Florida. We do have another webinar tomorrow and that's gonna be following what we anticipate as an order from Mayor Demings here in Orange County. We're gonna unpack some of that. And we encourage you to get our daily briefing through the Winter Park Chamber if you log on to winterpark.org. All you have to do is put in your email. We'll make sure that you receive our daily briefing. This time I wanna hand it over to Amy Morgan for our questions and personally thank our panelists and certainly Representative Eskamani for making this possible today. Amy. Okay, thank you all for your questions. We're getting a lot of questions coming through. Um, I'm gonna read out a couple of questions that were typed out to us, but in addition, the best practice is to raise your hand through Zoom. Um, and that will alert me that you have a question and I will go ahead and unmute you um, when we have time for your question. Um, so you can find that raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Um, just click that and let it, let it sit until I call on you. Um, but before um, we get to any raised hands, there are uh, a couple of questions that weren't answered yet. One um, was from an anonymous attendee. At what point does the business need to demonstrate it has been affected at the time of application or later on? By way of example, if a business applies in anticipation of being affected by COVID-19 but has not yet felt the effect because the revenue receipt typically trails by 30 days, would they be eligible to apply? Would they need to wait until their revenue receipts trail off? I can handle that. Yeah, uh, this is Mike Murray. Um, no, you do not need to wait to apply. Uh, economic injury is generally substantiated by, uh, by spreading out your historical performance or financial statements along with projections over the period of time in which you estimate the uh, economic or disaster to, to affect your business. Uh, that's really in the art of the application itself and where I think the SBDC disaster loan specialist can really assist you. Uh, uh, one, one thing to note with the SBA economic injury disaster loan application, a mistake that's commonly made, especially by businesses in Florida, um, is that so many businesses are seasonal and if they don't spread their financial statements and projections uh, accordingly, it could impact the amount of money in which you could be approved for that particular loan program. So there's little nuances with respect to the application process, and I would encourage you to seek the professional assistance of our SBDCs um, prior to hitting that submit button. Amy, you're muted. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering that, Michael. I was just saying, um, I appreciate you answering so many of the questions in the text box as well as in the question and answer. So for those on the call, um, you're welcome to go through the chat box and see some of the answers that were provided by panelists. Um, there's also a, a Q&A section where you can view the answers that the panelists have, have um, typed out to you. Does anyone else have a question? I don't see any hands raised at this time. Looks like there's a few more questions in the Q&A box. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. So we have, okay, well, overall, we've had a lot of questions come through about timing and what to expect. Um, I believe I heard the answer of two weeks but is there any other color that you can provide to what the expectation is once you submit your application? No, we recognize that so many have submitted their applications by email, by mail, by fax, and by uh, online application. We're working, or actually DEO um, and its team there are working to actually transpose all of the hard copies and email applications received into the online environment right now. So we ask for your patience as they, they do that for thousands of different applications received. Um, we actually just sent a truckload of applications of about 700 received just yesterday by mail over to Tallahassee for DEO to put them into the system. So give us some time. Um, if you don't hear anything within two weeks of submitting your application, please give DEO and that toll-free number that I gave earlier 
a call to find out what your status of your application is. Um, by that time as well, the, uh, your local SVDC disaster loan specialist should have full access to the online system uh, and be able to find out the status of that application as well. Thank you, Michael. And we do have a couple of hand raise, hands raised right now. So Melissa, I'm going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this. Um, my question is, um, let's say for the bridge loan, you applied for 50,000, uh, but based on the uh, approval committee, they think, oh, okay, well, this, this person really should only be approved for 25. Are you denied or um, is, are you given a lower approval amount? The, uh, the independent uh, bridge loan review committee, which is generally compromised of, uh, or compromised, composed of uh, individuals uh, that are generally small business bankers or familiar with micro loan banking, um, uh, will review each applicant's uh, uh, need and make a determination. If they determine that the amount applied for um, in, uh, is, is higher than, than what the business uh, can take on from a new debt service perspective, they will approve a lower amount. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for your question, Melissa. Um, we have another hand raised. Kathy, I'm going to unmute you right now so you can ask your question. I think you're actually muted on your end, Kathy. Okay, there we go. Hi, thank you so much for offering this. Uh, learned a lot of information. I'm currently helping my small business clients. I'm a CPA. And one of my questions is, do, is there a cheat sheet or a formula that we could use similar to what the loan assist specialists are using for the economic injury? Uh, that way we are not bombarding your office if we can assist our clients with um, obtaining that number before applying. Um, if you're talking about the economic injury disaster loan, uh, that is the federal SBA loan, uh, regrettably, uh, it seems to be that uh, the underwriting criteria with respect to that particular loan program is a trade secret. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, I'm unable to find out exactly uh, what they mean by credit elsewhere or um, by what uh, uh, the threshold is with respect to substantial economic injury. Um, so I can't help you out in that particular case. As it relates to the uh, bridge loan program, there's really no real science behind it. Um, each independent uh, bridge loan committee has the, uh, the authority to make a determination with respect to the application and need uh, for the business. Um, as it relates to applying for an amount greater than $50,000 for the Florida bridge loan program, which is allowed for in certain circumstances, you got to have a bona fide business reason why. It, we generally look at and examine the operating expenses that the business needs um, uh, in order to continue operations uh, in employment levels. Um, but generally that's reserved, uh, that's the amount between 50 and up to $100,000 for the bridge loan. Um, is generally reserved for our larger small businesses. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. We'll take one more question and then we'll do our best to answer the rest um, with the materials we're able to send. Christy, I see you have a question. I'm gonna unmute you so you're able to talk. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm wondering what resources are available that any of you know of for solo business owners and if, if there's any chance that the emergency bridge loan would open up for people who run their own businesses. I'm a therapist and I run my own business. I don't have a partner. I only have my income to depend on um, and I don't have any clients at this time because everyone has no money to pay for therapy. Um, so I'm a little, a little panicky that I can't apply for the, the emergency bridge loan. And if I just should take that off my list of potential things, I'd like to just know that. But other resources for solo business owners would be fantastic. Yeah, Christy. Uh, yeah, regrettably, the uh, Florida Small Business Emergency Bridge Loan Program, when it was created, was really intended to not just be a, a business saver, but a job saver um, for Florida businesses. 
uh, in each activation, uh, the governor has certain flexibility to change the criteria. Uh, in this particular event, what Governor DeSantis did was expand the definition of employee. Uh, so I'll just remind that yeah, we're not talking about just W-2 employees, um, and I'm not sure whether or not you use independent contractors in your business or not. Um, but independent contractors and leased employees also count towards that particular threshold. Um, but the uh, SBA's uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is available for businesses of all sizes. So self-employed individuals or sole proprietorships are able to apply for the federal disaster loan. Um, that may be your best recourse at this particular time because I do not see that they're going to expand um, or change the uh, the employee uh, threshold with respect to the bridge loan program. Thank you so much for that information. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, we are reaching the end of our webinar and I want to be very mindful of our panelists time if they've, they've already taken um, the whole hour out to be with us and share this, this very, very important information. Um, so I do see your questions that you've submitted on the chat as well as the Q&A. We will um, take a look at those items and see if there's um, content for another webinar next week. Um, do know that we are working hard to provide a webinar every day for you at 4 p.m. As Betsy mentioned, tomorrow we will have some information shared about the, um, the information that's shared tonight, basically. So we'll have a Q&A about that with some, some experts that can lead you through what the potential lockdown might mean for you in Orange County. Um, then on Thursday, we will have cybersecurity for remote employees, especially those that are newly remote. So we encourage you to attend if you have staff or you yourself are possibly working remotely now. And then on Friday, we will have a, um, a webinar based on how managers should be interacting with their employees as they work remotely. So um, join us in one of our future webinars and feel free to email us if you have any other questions um, that you'd like addressed in one of our webinar series. We will be sending out an email to all attendees with some of the material that we discussed today, as well as a survey. On that survey, we'd love to hear about how um, you felt this webinar went, and if you have any topics you'd like to see in the coming weeks, we would love to address those. So thank you for everyone that attended, and thank you especially to all of our panelists for sharing this great information. We appreciate you being here. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone.